Hello, Augies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, and I'm almost complete today, except I just had a tooth pulled, and so my dentures don't fit. Anyway, we've got a very interesting question today, and I used it to do some antenna modeling, and we'll see the results of that. This question comes from Sandy, uh, WB4EVH. He says he has a 160 meter inverted V with an apex at 50 feet. Okay, that's nowhere near a half wavelength. So this is gonna be an NVIS antenna. The d direction's gonna go up and out. The beam width is 90 degrees, so 45 on a side. So it can hit the ionosphere at an angle and come down and cover a circle five or 600 miles in diameter. So it makes a great NBIS antenna. Now this is an inverted V, so the ends are about 20 feet off the ground. The antenna is oriented east-west. Let's assume we have more or less correct pattern for this antenna. It's gonna be nearly circular in terms of azimuth, and as far as elevation is concerned, it's mostly gonna go straight up. We'll see that in a minute. I know this is low for a 160 meter antenna. It's really hard to get an 160 meter antenna very high. A half wavelength, which is the, supposedly the correct height for the feed point, is 80 meters, 240 feet about. It's way up in the air. And the takeoff angle is assumed influenced by its low height. Yeah, mostly straight up. If you move the ends toward each other to make the antenna look like an arrow, how far do you have to move the ends toward each other before the pattern changes? How does the pattern change and what does it look like? I've tried to model this, but I'm not very good with antenna software. Well, Sandy, we're going to model it and we're going to take a look at it. Uh, before we do so, I'd like to thank patron Brian Stevens for his uh, uh, additions to the channel funds to help us keep going. Uh, you too can become a patron of this channel by going to patreon.com slash ke0og and picking a plan that works for you. The plans are named after subatomic particles just for fun. Okay, so let's take a look at his, what he's going to turn into a cockeyed inverted V. Now, this is what he has right now. He has this V, and if you look at it from the top, plan view, it's just a long straight line, okay? So I, I did a little dot, dot, dot here that this point right here, the apex refers to the apex right here. This is a side view, sort of a perspective view of the antennas. 50 feet at the center, 20 feet at the ends. Now what he wants to do is take this end and pull it over here and see what happens, okay? So his antenna, the plan view, is going to look like an arrow, okay? It pointed this way, and the apex is this point right here. So looking straight down on it, it's an arrow. Uh, looking at it from the side, it's just got a 90 degree angle. Now, why did I go so radically that way? Uh, that was to find out really what would happen in kind of an extreme case. Let's take a look at the input, input to the modeling. These are the wires in his original case. Um, there's just two wires, one on each side of the feed point, and 50 feet in the middle, and 20 feet at the ends. And to get a decent SWR, I made the lengths 120 feet. So that corresponds to right here, 120 feet this way and minus 120 feet this way. So um, that gives us the original antenna. Now here is the antenna changed. We just swapped the 120s here so that it would, instead of doing what it did before and going off the minus y axis, it went out off the x axis over here, okay? So let's get to some results. The SWR on the original antenna uh, is less than two to one in this region. Now, by adding a few feet or two, or subtracting a few feet or two to each end, you can move this 
to anywhere you want it. There's no way to make a simple wire antenna that will cover the whole band, uh, you, but you can cover a portion of the band. Now, when you push the antenna out like this, the SWR becomes a little more difficult. Uh, this is less than three to one. Notice the range changes up a little bit. So you'd have to add three or four feet to get it back down over in this region right here. And notice also it's like 2.8 SWR. And so you're probably going to need an external tuner. I would feed it with ladder line instead of coax. And uh, that way you have fewer losses. Although you're not going to have many losses at 160 meters with regular coax. Now, here's the important thing. Uh, let's look at the gain. This is the elevation, okay? The elevation patterns look the same for uh, both. Slightly different here. The beam width, remember, is going to be the 3 dB point. One, two, and three is right there. So right there to about right there is the beam width. It's going to be a little over 90 degrees. 45 this way, 45 this way. A lot of people think an NVIS antenna shoots straight up, and the most gain is straight up, but you have well within your 3 dB beam width a huge part here, so you could shoot up here, hit the ionosphere, come down, and hit somebody else with a similar antenna over here without too much of a problem. Now, the difference is in the fine print. This is the fine print right here. I made the fine print a lot bigger. The cursor elevation, that's the max gain, is 90 degrees. The gain is 5.28 dB gain over an isotropic antenna. And now you say, wait a minute, this is a dipole. You can't have that much gain. Oh, yes, you can. In the Amateur Extra book where it talks about a dipole having a gain of 2.15 um, dBi, that's in free space. I have yet to see a ham radio antenna in free space. Even the uh, ham antenna on board of the International Space Station um, it's not in free space because it's working against the space station itself. Okay, so you get some ground reflection gain here. And instead of the 2.15, you get about double that in terms of gain straight up. Now note it comes down by 3 dB here and here. So it comes down to 2.28 um, 2 and so on over here. But you do have gain. Now let's go over here to the new one. It drops a dB. Drops a dB. Now that is not so bad. It's one dB. So the difference between this antenna and this antenna is one dB of gain. Now you ask what happens to the pattern. Well, a um, inverted V is a nearly circular azimuth pattern with uh, a little less off to the sides. This has the same pattern, except it's rotated 90 degrees. So you got a little less off here and a little less off here, but otherwise it works fine. So what's the bottom line here? The bottom line is making a radical change in the way an antenna is set up because of your circumstances, can make for a tiny 1 dB change uh, in what you end up with. What this means is you've got lots of opportunity to explore what your system can do for you, uh, even if you have to make radical changes or droop antenna elements or something like that. The, now it does move your SWR, you may have to use a tuner and some ladder line, but uh, in terms of gain um, going up, because that's where the main gain is, we're down a, uh, a 1 dB. 
Okay, so Sandy, uh, the bottom line is that even with your cockeyed inverted V uh, kind of folded in half like that, you're losing a dB, 1 dB. And for most NVIS types of things, uh, they're, they're not signal strength limited, they're more distance limited because they're pulled into a circle about 500 miles. And with 100 to 1500 watts or whatever you want to put into that thing, uh, you're only losing a dB. That's one sixth of an S unit. And that's pretty good. That's not bad. So there you have it. We've taken a look at a, uh, what happens if you've got a cockeyed inverted V. And as it turns out, it works. Now this ought to give you, as an experimenter, uh, some pause for thought. Because it means that if you do not have an optimum situation where you can put your antenna up, you can actually modify it fairly severely and have it still work. So, very interesting thought. So, um, if you would like to help support this channel financially, you can go to dcastler.com slash support. Pick a way that works for you. Patreon's in there, too. And until we next meet, 73.